Okay. So uh, can you start off by introducing yourself? Yes, my name is Dr. Morgan Francis, and I'm a licensed therapist in clinical psychology. And I own the private practice Scottsdale Premier Counseling, and I see patients struggling with eating disorders, body image stressors, uh, relationships, uh, anxiety and depression, and sexual health issues. And I've been in private practice um, for 20 years now. Oh and God. I'm in Scottsdale, Arizona, and um, I feel really honored and uh, grateful for being able to work with the people that I get to see because they are all such amazing human beings. That's so phenomenal. Oh my God. Okay. If you don't mind me asking you, like, what made you want to sort of specialize in this area? So I had struggled with my own body image issues when I was growing up. Um, and I remember dieting, going on very restrictive um, diets myself, trying to oh, lose weight for events. Um, it affected my medical health. Um, I began a really horrible series of uh, struggling with restriction and then uh, bulimia and binge eating. So really had a many years of really hating my body. Um, and then one day I came across, um, a website and I wish I could remember who it was because I would give them so much credit, but I don't. Um, but the website nonetheless said, you know, you don't have to diet anymore. You can love your body just as it is right now. And I thought, no way that's impossible. That is such a far crazy idea that I can be wow. happy in the body that I'm in right now, because it was never enough. It was always about losing weight and shrinking and getting skinny and being thinner. Um, mm -hmm. so then I started to really shift the way that I thought about food and my body. And so I really started to work with a therapist to help me um, stabilize my food intake. So I was medically safe and then really break down these messages that I had been carrying for so long. So once I got through all that, um, I was in graduate school and I always knew I wanted to go into counseling. I just didn't really know what sector and population I really wanted to work with. And, um, the universe, God, life just called me to work where I'm working now. And, um, mm -hmm. so I do work with individuals that, um, have gone through what I've gone through. And I think it is helpful for them to hear, like I've been on the couch myself. And so I Absolutely. get it, Absolutely. you know, and so that they know that there's a part of me that can definitely relate to their experience. And, um, I have a lot of empathy and patience for people because I know how long it took me. So um, it's a really safe place when I work with individuals around eating disorders and body image. Okay, I get. Okay, so um, how long did it take you approximately? And how, how long does it usually take people to sort of recover from? Anything? Well, everybody's different. So it depends on the severity of their eating disorder. So for some people, because I'm an outpatient provider, I only can see people um, on, you know, uh, maybe at most once a week, mm -hmm. right? So for those individuals that are needing more care, they're going to need to go to um, like a PHP or basically like a private uh, like hospitalization or mm -hmm. Um, they're going to need a more, you know, long-term care where they're in a residential treatment facility. So for some people, it can take years and years. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just the eating disorder part. The body image piece is something a little bit different because you don't have to meet the, let's say the diagnoses of having an eating disorder to struggle with having a negative body image because they're, yeah. they're two separate issues. So with body image, I mean, anyone can walk around and have a negative body image, right? You could be really unhappy with your body, but you still could be, you know, not engaging in eating disorder behavior, um, mm -hmm. to meet a diagnosis of let's say anorexia nervosa and, or bulimia nervosa or, or binge eating. So some people can take, you know, months and some people can take years. I myself took, I mean, for my eating disorder, I took years, and then the body image piece took years as well. And I think also, you know, becoming a mother, it really 
helped me to heal my body image because I re- I really did not want to pass down any of the messaging that I grew up with to my children. So um, that was a definitely a, a huge intentional part for me to make sure that I'm I'm doing well. Okay, I- I'm so glad you sort of pointed that out because I wanted to ask you this because I mean of course I'm not like general people here but I think most women struggle with um, body image because of our society has like made us you know um, we supposed to look a certain way and we supposed to look like Instagram models and those things are not really high they're really edited so uh, what qualifies as like an ED versus just something that can be dealt with I, I, I do know a lot of women that do diet but I still don't know if that would qualify as being like an eating disorder so are you saying what would qualify for an eating disorder is that what you asked or what would qualify for body image both okay <laughs> so <laughs> body image, um the way that i define body image is your beliefs your attitudes your feelings your behaviors mm-hmm. um about the way that you look and mm-hmm. that goes from the top of your head all the way down to your feet mm-hmm. and there are so many things that can um, where, where that can influence our body image. Mm -hmm. So certain areas, maybe, um, how your parents talked about your body, Mm -hmm. how your parents talked about women's bodies, Mm -hmm. how let's say men talk about women's bodies, how your friends treated you because of the way that you looked, um, the messaging that we see in marketing and advertising or social media, mm-hmm. there could be specific traumatic events um, that you experienced that now makes you feel very self-conscious or insecure or have um, trauma related to certain body parts. Mm-hmm. Um, you could have something genetically about you that um, you got teased for or bullied um, and therefore your body image struggled because of that. Um, So those are just some of the areas that can affect our body image. And it's important to be able to identify when I'm working with somebody, the etiology or the development of their body image because there's a, oftentimes I'm working, let's say with a 35 year old woman, but mm-hmm. her trauma is from when she was 12 years old. Oh. So I need to go back to that, that time when she was 12 to understand mm-hmm. how that affected her and the beliefs that she made up about herself and how those beliefs have now shaped the way that she has lived her life mm-hmm. as a 35 year old woman. Mm-hmm. So with eating disorders, there's certain diagnostic criteria that the DSM or the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, which is what we use to diagnose somebody, Mm -hmm. um, have have a treatment plan um, that they have to meet in order to get a diagnosis of an eating disorder. Mm -hmm. So the most common eating disorder disorder is binge eating disorder. Mm -hmm. And that there's more people that suffer from binge eating disorder than anorexia and bulimia combined. Mm -hmm. So binge eating is very pervasive. And yet I, I feel like it's not talked about a lot Mm -hmm. because there's shame around the overeating aspect of binge eating. Mm -hmm. And I also think in my opinion, many of the individuals that I've seen that struggle with binge eating would never look like they struggle with binge eating. I mean, many, yeah, many fitness professionals, um, people that are up on stage in, you know, the bikinis, Mm -hmm. um, you know, walking around, um, or I'll have athletes struggling with binge eating. And it's because there's been such a deprivation and restriction Mm -hmm. around their food in order to be able to be on the stage, to be in the fitness competition or to perform at an elite level for sports that when they stop competing or they stop performing in their sport, they're so hungry and their body just wants to eat. And it's a way to really uh, dysregulate from their emotions and start to be in their body. And it's a vicious cycle. 
And oh. so many individuals will struggle with binge eating. Mm -hmm. So that kind of breaks it down a little bit to understand that there are diagnostic criteria for eating disorders. And then there are things that can happen in our lives that affect the way that we experience our body that would constitute more as the body image. Okay, I got, okay, so you, you spoke about, um, you know, athletes having that struggle, right? So, um, okay, you know how they say you should give your body what you want, like if it's craving something and if it's deficient, it's asking for something and you shouldn't like sort of ignore that. But um, what, if someone's struggling with binge eating, should they let themselves, uh, how do I put this, like let them eat or should they? stop it? Should they listen to their body or not? That's a great question. And so there's a difference between honoring your hunger mm -hmm. or eating something that you find satisfying mm -hmm. versus binging. Okay. So when let's say I really want Oreos, mm -hmm. I like, Oh gosh, Oreos sounds so good to me uh -huh. and have the means to be able to get the Oreo then I'm going to have an Oreo mm -hmm. where binge eating would come in as if I want the Oreo mm -hmm. and I eat the Oreos, but then I keep eating and I'm eating past my satisfaction. I'm eating past my fullness. And mm -hmm. once I'm there, I'm like, well, I might as well eat the ice cream. I might as well eat the brownies. I might as well eat the potato chips. Like I just keep going and going. So I'm consuming a very large amount of food in mm -hmm. a very short time period. Okay. And I feel an immense sense of shame after engaging in that behavior. Okay. Got it. Okay. So I, I know this might be completely unrelated, but, um, you know, you've been in this field, is this anything like addiction um, in terms of alcohol or something as well? Like um, some similar where you can't like stop drinking, pick up the next Absolutely. Drink. It can be very similar. Um, so the ways that it's similar is that for some people, it's very much an escape. Okay. Right. Like when a person is drinking or using drugs or using pornography, they're mm -hmm. escaping from their reality. It's a mm -hmm. way of, I don't want to think about my feelings. I don't want to be feeling at all. I, this motion of like taking the food and putting it into my mouth is very soothing, mm -hmm. right? That's the way that I soothe myself through the troubles or the stressors in my life. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, we do see, and there's a lot of research with, you know, uh, the brain of how there, it can be in very similar areas of the brain where the, you know, certain parts of the brain are getting, you know, highlighted or um, they're getting activated, just like a person who struggles with pornography or drug use or substance abuse would also experience. Mm -hmm. But one of the key factors, and I say this a lot to people that are struggling with binge eating is the difference between alcohol and binge eating is that you have to eat to live. Right. Right. You have to eat to survive. You don't have to drink in order to live. You don't have to use drugs in order to live. You don't have to use pornography in order to survive, but you do have to eat. And so it, it's, it's like, they can never get away from the food because they have to eat in order to can remain living. So that's the difference. And it makes it really challenging because you're surrounded by food every day of your life. Okay. Got it. Okay. So, um, this might be, uh, I, I don't know if it's something you can answer, Ben, and please go ahead and stop me if it's not all right. Um, so drugs usually um, can make you, a lot of drugs can sort of reduce your appetite. So mm -hmm. um, can that be sort of connected with someone who wants to lose weight, like with body image, drug addiction? and So I had on. people... Yeah, I've had people use Adderall, which is a mm -hmm. stimulant for aid to treat ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Mm -hmm. um, I've had people use Adderall to lose weight. Absolutely. Because Adderall is classified as a uh, second class drug, which is the same mm -hmm. as what we would see as a amphetamines. Mm -hmm. And so and it creates... Um, restrictions. You're not hungry. You, you can go long periods of time without eating. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so, yes, I have had individuals use Adderall as a means to lose weight. Mm -hmm. Obviously that would be something that is not at all recommended or it's intended use and can be a very harmful. And it has caused a lot of harm to people that I've worked with. Um, and, uh, it's, it's really not good. So you, you really have to go into a treatment for the, the drug use in order to detox it from your body and kind of start all over again. So that, that is something I have seen, but I haven't seen much of other drugs, um, Mm -hmm. that are not prescribed for weight loss for that people have, have used. Okay, but that must be so difficult. Like you have to have, um, you have to deal with the ADHD and the addiction and the eating disorder at the same time. Like that's that's pretty difficult to handle. I can't even imagine yeah. that. Yeah, um, so that's where you would bring in other providers. So there would be a treatment team. So yeah. when someone is severe and really struggling, it is important uh, for me not to take all that on, but to have other people that that person can see um, in order to help them, because there's so many areas that we're really trying to target at, at once. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. So, you know, you mentioned um, that you're a parent and you didn't want to sort of pass down um, that to your children, which is honestly such a wonderful thing. I wish people thought of that before they have kids. Um, so I know. <laughs> before they do something like that. Um, what do you... Uh, what kind? What What would you recommend parents? Um, you know, how can they support their children with body image if their child is probably bullied in school and has like a very bad body image? Like, how can a parent support their child? That's such a good question. So, if the child is already being, let's say, made fun of or bullied, I think it's really important that the parents understand that this is very painful for the child, mm-hmm. right? And 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 to listen, mm-hmm. right? I think parents come in, can come in obviously very reactive and they may have their own feelings from their own experience of being bullied about their body mm-hmm. that gets in the way of the of them being able to see their children's pain. Mm-hmm. And I don't fault any parents for that. Mm-hmm. I, I think that that's a very um, common reaction is to think about, well, this is what I did and this is what you should do. Mm -hmm. Right. Instead of really putting that aside and saying, okay, my, my child's a different person than I was. Mm -hmm. And the world is different now than it was when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. And so how can I support my child? And, and that support can oftentimes look like listening and validating. Okay. And then there might be other, depending upon the severity of what's going on, there may be a need to take higher action, which would be, you know, talking to officials or teachers or uh, administration at the school to, to really see what, what we can do to protect that child. Um, and it also depends if this is happening online. So mm-hmm. sometimes that we need to take precautions and not have, you know, the child online to not put the child being exposed to cyberbullying. So it really depends about the severity and the context that it's happening in. Mm -hmm. And I've seen parents be able to do those things and really make it better for their child. And with that being said, the child still feels this consciousness and this insecurity Mm -hmm. about their body. So for example, I'm working with one teenager right now um, and she's lost a, a substantial amount of weight um, in her teenage years and not really on purpose. Um, I think her body has grown and she went through puberty and, um, she had some injuries where, you know, she really couldn't eat a lot of food because of the medication she was on and her injury. So she just really happened to lose a lot of weight now because she lost a lot of weight she's gotten compliments about her weight loss. Oh, you look so great. You're so thin. Your clothes look amazing on you. You know, all these things. So we talked about it and, you know, she said that for her, she doesn't have any concern about food. If if you were to put a bowl of pasta in front of her, she'd eat the pasta. If you were to put cookies in front of her, she'd eat the cookies. I mean, in fact, she ate cookies earlier in the day before I met her. Mm -hmm. Um, 
you know, she loves candy. She, she loves to have what her mom cooks for her. Um, she's not, she doesn't, you know, she doesn't have a desire to go over exercise. She, all she does is walk. She doesn't even really, um, exercise. And so she's not using a scale. There's, there's nothing that she's doing to continue to, um, be preoccupied with her thinness. However, okay what she was able to identify is that she's very fearful of being fat or oh. gaining weight back because when she was in a larger size body, society, family members, her friends told her she was ugly and she was fat. No. So, you know, that is a very real experience for her. So she's like, you know, I, I don't, I don't worry about my body right now. I would worry if my body went back to the way it was. Mm -hmm. And so now I said to her mother, we're really going to have to keep an eye on her because if she, you know, bodies are going to change. There's, you know, for so many reasons, just like it changed right now with her, her puberty and genetics and just life happening. Um, and then changes in her medication, she lost weight, but let's say her health, her medical health would, would take a different turn and she has to go back on this medication. And maybe the one of the side effects is weight gain of the medication. Mm -hmm. Would she refuse the medication because she's so fearful of the side effects of weight gain? Oh no. Right. Yeah. Right. And so it's, it's just, it's really horrible. So for her, this is a real fear. So for me to invalidate that and say, well, you shouldn't feel that way would be right. really wrong of me. So it's about holding space for where she's at right now and making sure that we're not going down the path of an eating disorder where she is skipping meals, where she is worried about calories. I mean, she had no idea about anything to do with calories when I spoke with her, nothing. She's like, wait, calories, what are, what are calories? She's like, oh. I don't, yeah. She's like, I don't really even understand. And I was like, wow. Okay. Wow, okay. So there really wasn't any, you know, desire to mean, you know, to be in a, let's say restrictive, um, eating phase right now. It was the fear and the trauma of what she went through when she was, let's say six, seven, eight, nine years of age. Okay. Okay. So she associates, um, does she think like eating would make a fat eventually or like how does she No, think? she just, it's just any, like those images of her, the clothes that she was wearing. She's mm -hmm. like, you know, now I like to be in clothes that show my body before mm -hmm. I felt like I had to cover up my body. Mm -hmm. And so she's very proud of where she is. She's she, but she just is concerned that like, I don't want to get back there. I don't want to go back to a place where people are making fun of me and I'm being labeled something or I'm being told I'm ugly. And so that is where, you know, and that's really not in her control if we think about it. Right. right? I mean, that's, that's, that's out of our control. We can't control what people say to us. Mm -hmm. We can't control how people talk to us. All we can control is how we respond mm -hmm. to what people say about us. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's some of the work we're going to do is looking at what you have control over versus what you don't have control over. And to remember that no matter what size she is, her body's always been an amazing body, a great body. Right. Yeah. That is such a beautiful, but um, I'm sorry. I know I said this before, but what you're doing is just so wonderful. It's just Thank so you. wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I just have two more questions. Um, yeah. So you, you, you spoke about her like not, um, you know, no, knowing calories. I'm pretty surprised that you know, uh, young women, um, don't don't know what calories is. I I think that's a good thing. Honestly, yes, I do too. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a good thing. Like stay out of it. But yeah. um, in such a circumstance, would you think, uh, exercise helps with body image and like, eating disorders in any way, or does can it like worsen it in the sense that you sort of over go overboard and you eat, you sort of um, exercise so much that um, as a coping mechanism to not um, feel guilty when you eat food? That makes Great sense. question. So oftentimes, yes, exercise can be, um, let's say, unhelpful mm -hmm. to the person when they're suffering from uh, eating disorder. Mm -hmm. So when I'm getting to know someone's um, you know, uh, history. I do ask a lot about exercise and how much they were exercising, what activities they were doing to exercise. And so when I'm working with someone that is struggling with the eating disorder, it is important that 
the intensity of their exercise decreases, the frequency or how much they're exercising decreases. And mm -hmm. so <clears throat> it's more about movement. So exercise and movement are very different. So exercise is quantified, meaning mm -hmm. like I measure it. It's time evaluated. It might be caloric evaluated. It mm -hmm. might be, you know, um, uh, like it, it, I'm looking at data, basically I'm it's measurable okay. movement can look like anything. It could be stretching. It could be, um, gardening. It yeah. could be, um, you know, I went and swam with my girlfriend today in the pool, you mm -hmm. know, like we played in the pool for 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. Like that's just movement, right? Mm -hmm. Sun salutations movement, right? Mm -hmm. So they're very different. It's not, it's not measured. Okay. So what I often try to get to is let's do something that makes your body feel alive and feel good rather than looking at it as I need to get my cardio in because I need to create a deficit over oh, how many calories I consumed. Right. Or, you know, I ate so much on over the weekend. Now I've got to burn it off on the, in the gym on Monday morning because I ate too much on Sunday. So we want to get away from that kind of talk and use exercise and movement towards longevity, right. To mm -hmm. prevention of injury to let's say like, I mean, I'll take myself an example. Like I really wanted to work on my flexibility. So I started doing yoga, okay. right. It wasn't about, you know, weight loss. It was about, mm -hmm. I need to work on my flexibility. I'm aging. Mm -hmm. I want to become stronger, you know? So I, I do strength training because I want to be, feel stronger in my body. I want to have muscle definition because I want to have, um, you know, just overall muscle mass. I think that's important as we age, especially for women, when we go through menopause and I'm in my forties. So I, it's something I really need to make sure I'm doing. It's not about weight loss for me. It's not about getting into a certain size of clothing, right. Which is where that is the difference. I think between the two, it's like, this is aesthetic based and this is just medical mental health longevity. Okay. Okay. You look amazing. Oh, in, in your yeah. <laughs> yeah. so um okay so i just have one more question but um i don't know if this happens where you know um with addiction people do like relapse right so mm -hmm. um uh, with someone let's say they have recovered from an ed or uh, body image issues um but they sort of fall into a pit where they're depressed or they go into something or they went through a breakup or something very bad and they feel like um they might slip in again and they feel like they want to eat lots of food or not eat food. Uh, what do you recommend for someone who's been going through something like that? Well, I mean, you're right. Um, relapses can happen. I mean, old habits die hard, mm -hmm. right? So I often tell my clients that exercise, I mean, exercise, eating disorders, um, and the treatment and the that we go through it's a it's a very humbling experience mm -hmm. and we can't take our recovery for granted okay right we we constantly have to be um you know fine tuning our work and so even for myself you know i've been i've gone through so much with my body and you know, now I'm that I'm in my forties and I'm, you know, my body's aging. I mean, it's, it's just changing there. And, and so it's, I didn't have women around me telling me like how amazing it is to age, mm -hmm. you know, aging was something to be scared of aging mm -hmm. was something to prevent mm -hmm. aging was something to go find a cosmetic surgeon to take care of it for you. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, I, I don't want to have that messaging in my, in my, um, brain. And mm -hmm. so and I don't want my children to see me afraid to age. Mm -hmm. So I, I think also it's, it's being able to be very conscious and really work on our, our befriending of our body, okay. even, if, even if we've had a form of eating disorder. Mm -hmm. So if anyone is struggling with eating disorder and all of a sudden, you know, they're doing well for years and then they're slipping back into old habits or patterns. Mm -hmm. I would recommend that they would 
talk with a therapist again, or, you know, let's say maybe they, they kept a journal of all their, of all their notes and kind of go back to the things that worked before to help them out of it. Okay. And I, I also say to people, Hey, you're not starting from ground zero, right? You're, you're not, you, now, you know, you can get through it because you already did. Right. So now you have evidence to, mm -hmm. to give you that confidence to say, of course, I don't want to be back here, but I know I can, I can get out of here. I know I can get out of the eating disorder again, because I've already have. And so sometimes relapses can happen because life happens, but it's not something we need to stay in a shame about and okay. we can get through it so that we can be ourselves again. Yay. Yeah. Um, so I'm so sorry. Before we end this, I think we have a question from a member. Um, yes. Which, oh, oh, okay. Um, how does one stay motivated for exercise and diet if you eat and still don't see progress, uh, especially when it comes to getting muscles as it seems more hard than losing fat? So I, I love this question because sometimes the progress is not meant to be seen. Oh, sometimes the progress is going on inside of us. Okay. So a really good way to determine if there's been progress are to do lab work. So mm -hmm. blood work, mm -hmm. right? So looking at, you know, what are my labs now? And then what are my labs after, let's say three months of, if we're doing strength training and if we're eating on a consistent basis and we're hydrating, you know, what are my labs now saying, Am I, are, are, you know, is my magnesium better? Is my um, let's say my phosphate better is my creatine better is my sodium letter better is my white blood count improved is my red blood count improved what about my gi how is my gi symptoms improved how are my bowel movements improved what about my sleep habits am i getting better quality of sleep now that i'm eating on a consistent basis and i'm exercising what about my hydration how's my skin feeling how's my nails and my hair growth feeling how is my mood Am I, am I a happier person? Am I enjoying life more? Am I less irritable? Am I handling my stress better? Am I getting out and socializing or am I, you know, so it's not maybe always something that we're going to see on our body, you know? And then I think that's the main thing I've had people be like, well, I'm doing what you're telling me to do, but I'm not losing weight. I'm like, but how's your sleep? Oh. Well, I'm, my sleep is much better. Okay. How are your knees feeling? Well, my knees don't hurt as much. Okay. How is your hydration? Are you um, having regular bowel movements? Yeah. I mean, I'm not as bloated. Well, that's good. So again, it's me, it's not going to be a number on the scale and it may not be something we see like now I have defined abs or I have better shoulders. Genetics play a big, big role in, in muscle mass, right? There's a lot of things to consider when we're looking at building lean muscle. And also what to consider too, is how much protein a person is taking in, right? And do I have access to that amount of protein if I'm trying to build lean muscle mass? Right. So I have a friend who is a, a big, she's a trainer and I was talking to her about strength training. And I said, yeah, you know, I'm trying to lift weights because, you know, I just want to do it for preventative reasons for my joints and my um, medical well being, And because I'm aging and she's like, okay, but if you're wanting to build like lean muscle mass, you're going to have to get this much protein in. I don't have the time to get that much protein in, <laughs> nor do I really want to be eating that much protein. And I was like, yeah, that's not really my goal. I mean, yeah, that would be nice if that would happen. But at the same time, like that's not really, really realistic for my my lifestyle right now, right. it's, it's more for other reasons. So I think also if we're chasing a, a, an image in our head of what we think our body should look like, we really need to, to question what that image is about. Is that, a, is that an image of, of myself from when I was younger? Is that an image that I saw maybe on social media that, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to look this way. And, mm -hmm. and why do I feel like I need to look like that woman? You know, what about that woman? Do I feel like I need to superimpose onto my body? Because her body is her body and your body is your body. And even if we ate the same things, even if we worked out the same, it doesn't mean we're going to look alike because your genetics, my genetics are very different. True. And there's so many things to consider, right? So that's where I tell people, move away from looking at your body and objectifying it from an aesthetic lens and look at what's going on inside and the results are typically inside. Okay. That is, I, I never thought of that um, in that way. Oh, thank you. So, oh, okay. 
do you think you have time for one more question or uh, okay. I can I can answer a question yeah. Okay. Um, yeah I think one second it's my chat box this um yeah okay um Rohit asks could you say a bit on gut health and how it impacts hormones and mood um uh, as bloating is a constant pain mm -hmm. so I am I'm not a gut expert mm -hmm. <laughs> I always tell people that there are so <laughs> people that know about gut health way more than I do. So, mm -hmm. but in my field, mm -hmm. there's a tendency for me to see what's called gastroparesis. Mm -hmm. So gastroparesis is a condition that happens with individuals when they've been restricting their food intake. Okay. And so when they're not eating very much, what ends up happening is that there's not the consistent, let's say, dumping of food into the small intestines mm -hmm. and so the enzymes are not being produced in order to break down the particles in the food and we're not seeing consistent bowel movements so when that happens the gas is a byproduct of that experience so there's a big like bloating or gas factor mm -hmm. that ends up happening and so what I end up getting is young, skinny, beautiful girls that are coming in and they're saying, I, I, you know, I can't eat because I get bloated. I can't eat because I have IBS. I can't eat because when I do, I look like I'm pregnant. Right. Uh, and the reality is, is that it's gastroparesis. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I'm saying this meaning like there's no allergies to food, right? This isn't like lactose intolerance. This isn't a gluten allergy. So I want to specify that. These are people that do not have allergies to food. They just are not eating. But when they do eat, they have bloating. Mm -hmm. So I had a woman that I was working with who was an actress. And this was a major issue for her because she, she couldn't audition for roles because her bloating was so bad that she mm -hmm. did look like she was almost like pregnant. Oh, no. Um I was so sad. And she had been to so many medical doctors. Like they put her on, you no, know, like cut out all the meat, cut out all the dairy, cut out all the sugar, do, so you know, only vegetables. And she was just miserable. So I was kind of like her last resort. And so she goes, you know, I don't know what to do. And I said, <laughs> okay, what we're going to do is we're going to slowly introduce some foods back into your digestive tract. And we're just going to, it's going to take time. It's going to take patience. We're going to do the therapy and we're going to work through this together. So we met on a very frequent basis mm -hmm. and little by little by little, mm -hmm. we were introducing foods back into her diet. We were, she was drinking a ton of water. She was mm -hmm. incorporating movement. She wasn't doing exercise. She wasn't okay. on the Stairmaster nonstop. She would take walks. She would do yoga. She would stretch. Um, she was sleeping, like getting to bed earlier, spending less time on her phone, mm -hmm. um, getting out with her friends. Um, and then all of a sudden her skin cleared up oh. and cause she was, she was having horrific, um, acne mm -hmm. and all of a sudden her skin cleared up. And then she's like, my skin feels so much better. Well, because she was eating, she was getting nutritional value again. She was getting vitamins and minerals to help with her skin. And then all of a sudden, like the things that she couldn't, she wasn't eating before. Now she was eating and the bloating decreased little by little by little. And she was able to get back out there and do her auditions. And she's done phenomenal. I'm so proud of her. And so it's been like, I, I think it took her two and a half, three years. I mean, again, I, I always tell people this takes time. This wasn't overnight. Um, and she's, she's, she's doing so good. She's, I'm so proud of her. She was, um, on a series she's auditioned for big time movies and she's like, I am so proud of myself. And she has, she has no fear around food. She eats what she oh, wants to eat. Yeah. She's happy. And it was just really about little by little by little drinking and eating the foods again and just honoring her body in a way that she hadn't before. So gastroparesis is something that is very common, unfortunately, and it's just often not diagnosed or it's looked at as, oh, you're allergic to something. And again, she didn't, she got tested for allergies. There was no findings that she was allergic to any food. Mm -hmm. And so when that happens, I'm typically like, okay, we we've, we've got to go at more of a, like a weight restoration plan, um, than anything else. And it, and it was helpful for her. So I was really happy. You're like a savior. Oh, wait, wait. Yeah. Uh Oh, just thank you so much for being here today. I can't thank you enough. And um, and You're welcome. I, I, of course, I love to promote you, but uh, is it possible for you to take um 
clients that are not. Um, I don't know if that's possible. With no, license. because my license is, is here in Arizona. Um, oh. I'm only able to do work with clients that are in Arizona, but I am going to be putting together um, like a, a coaching call. I'm okay. um, starting okay. September um, for individuals that, that want to work with people that are struggling with eating disorders or body image. Mm -hmm. And so I can, you know, basically be the person to provide, it'll be like psychoeducation, let's say in a topic about body image or eating disorders. And then the last 30 minutes will be Q and a. So let's okay. say like, Oh, I'm working with someone and this is what they're struggling with. How do I help them with this area? And so it'll be like a group coaching call. So for any of you that are interested in doing that, you can, you know, DM me and then I'll put you on my email list for when I get that program started, but I'm looking forward to doing it, um, starting it next month. And Yay. so that individuals can join. Yeah. That's be amazing. Great. Uh, if, if you could, uh, whenever it does, um, uh, send me the link, I'll send it to the community. Send it to yes. the list. We have like 120 members in there and a couple oh, of wonderful. So, um, I said it there and anyone who wants to join in yeah. would love to. I, I, where are you to? Yes, I'd love for you to. Where are you located? Uh, India. Oh my gosh, that's so amazing. That is so <laughs> cool. I love that. I love that we were able to connect through social media. And it's so amazing that I get to be a part of what you're doing. I think you're just wonderful in all that oh, you're doing awesome. and you're helping so many people. So thank you so much. It's been such an honor to be here in your community. So thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. I would, I would say the same for you. You're like a savior for so many people. When I heard the last story and um, you genuinely seem like such a kind person. Oh, yeah, thank so much love for you. You too. Oh my gosh. Oh, I just love how we're able to connect. So <laughs> please let me know if there's anything that you need from me. I'd be happy to help out and anything I can do as well. And and thank you again for having me on. It was such, such a pleasure talking with you. It was a pleasure talking to you. Uh, take care. Have a lovely day. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye.